that we're getting getting in some of our friends to join yeah. us. So, Elliot, awesome. if you would like to kick us off. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so good morning and welcome to the 2021 Greater Rochester Teen Book Festival, a full day book festival dedicated solely to teens. I'm Elliot Gavin, a teen volunteer, and this session is Writing Your Struggle, Mental Health in Writing. Before I introduce our panel, here are a few details for our session. If you have a question for our panel, please put it in the chat. Please remain muted during our session and please turn your camera off. This camera, this, I mean, this session is being recorded. Time to introduce our authors. Our Some fun facts about our first author is she had two pet raccoons when she was a teenager and interned at NASA and Paris before she was 14. Her debut novel, A Breath Too Late, raises awareness for suicide prevention. Her foundation, Hold On To Hope, focuses on uniting creatives to help end the stigma of mental health. Welcome, Rocky Callen. Our you. next author has worked as a database developer managed a wine company and even worked at Starbucks. His favorite musical is Little Shop of Horrors. He has a lot of books that explore the theme of gay science fiction. His his book Brave Face and his book Brave Face, he tells the story of his life and his struggle with mental illness. Welcome Sean David Hutchinson. Our last author loves the Great British Baking Show and dreamed of playing with the New York Philharmonic. She has explored many different genres, including fantasy, horror, and realistic fiction. Her novel, Some Kind of Happiness, is the idea that while living with depression and mental illness is hard, life can still be magical. Welcome, Claire Legrand. Okay, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Elliot. <laughs> All right. So, yes, everyone, welcome to uh, the panel, Writing Your Struggle, Mental Health and Writing. We have some three lovely authors here to discuss that in this very fitting month of May, Mental Health Awareness Month. So it is definitely great that we're kicking off the morning with this, just to kind of have something to keep in mind as we continue on in May. So I will hand it off to the authors if, you, if there's anything else you would like to just mention about yourselves, introduce your books. <sighs> so. Well, I... Elliot, you did a wonderful job introducing us. Um, I don't think I need to add anything else to that. My books are behind me, you can see them. <laughs> um, and really excited to be here today. Thank you to everyone who's, who's joining us this morning. Thank you, yes, thank you so much, Elliot, for that awesome introduction. I'm so excited to be here. This is my first time being involved and I'm so excited. And I'm just really looking forward to an awesome day with all of you. Yeah, uh, same. Nothing really to add. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you, everybody, for being here. This is really awesome. And uh, my books are also back there. And <laughs> <laughs> you can tell that I'm the baby author because their books like take up all the shelves. <laughs> and I have my, my baby book. <laughs> <laughs> that released during the pandemic last year. Oh, so goodness. my whole like debut experience has been virtual. And um, this has been, everybody talks about how this event is one of the most phenomenal ones. So I'm so excited. We're yeah. glad you're here. Yeah, we're yeah. so glad you're here. And your and book congratulations. Was... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> congratulations. Your cover is beautiful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right, I guess we'll just jump right into the nitty gritty of it. Uh, as we are talking about mental health, it doesn't seem like there's much of a way to kind of slide into it. So why don't we just hop in? Um, do you, when you're writing, do you draw from your own experience or is it more, I guess I'll just leave it at that. Do you draw from your own experience and then how? Um. Yes, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna jump in. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I definitely draw from my own experience, whether it's in terms of drawing upon my experience with mental health or drawing upon my experiences with other parts of my life. Um, my book, Some Kind of Happiness, uh, which is about an 11 year old girl who lives with undiagnosed anxiety and depression. Um, that was very much inspired by my experiences growing up when I was that age and starting to experience symptoms like panic attacks and not understanding what that meant. And 
I wish that I had had a book like this to help me develop a vocabulary and like a context for understanding what was going on. Um, and so I, I definitely drew upon not only my experiences with my own mental illnesses, but also my relationships with my family and um, other like sort of insecurities and uh, family drama things that happened. Um, I think all authors draw upon many, many different aspects of their lives when writing books. Yeah, especially with mental health, um, yeah. you know, like obviously like Brave Face is my memoir. So, I mean, it, it's, it is my life, but um, like most of my fiction involves mental health in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. um, like We Are the Ants, you know, a lot of people think that like I modeled the main character Henry after me, but it's actually uh, the, the character Jesse who um, ends his life prior to the beginning of the book, who is more modeled on me because I wanted to explore the idea of what might have, what life might have looked like if I hadn't survived. And it was, you know, because it was, it was something that I started thinking about way after, um, you know, because I, I attempted to end my life when I was 19 and, and I was very sort of centered on myself afterward. And, and it wasn't until later that I thought about how it would have affected my family and my friends and, and where the ants came out of that. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, especially with the mental health, I think it's, it's, uh, not, I don't want to say authentic, but I mean, it, it's, it, there are certain things that, you know, like you can always kind of tell someone who has never really dealt with depression because one of their first things is, you know, have you tried being happier? Have you tried smiling more? Or they try to tell you to change your diet or to exercise more. And it's, it's like, yeah, some of those things help, but I think you can just tell. So. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you were talking about Jesse and then how you wanted to see if you were no longer here, what would have happened. And that's exactly what a breath too late is, is Ellie has died on the first page and she has to walk through the devastation left behind, but also all of the memories that she has forgotten that led up to the moment of her passing. And I think that for me, as someone who starts struggling with suicidal ideation um, when I was 11, but on the exterior was a very like optimistic, bright, um, ambitious, like child and then young woman, um, I really processed those things in the dark and on my own. And I really wanted to show what that battle looks like. Um, you know, it's like a, on the exterior, it's a silent battle and on the interior. It's really feels sometimes like you're sort of waging war against these thoughts and these feelings. And so I wanted to show that on the page, um, but also writing a breath too late and talking about drawing from our own experiences. I rebelled writing this book because I knew that it would be really intimate and very raw and I didn't know if I could do it. And then there was just this urgency that I couldn't deny. And so I wrote the first draft sobbing every single day over the course of just over a week, I wrote the first draft. Oh wow! And it was just like me pulling out all these memories and all these things I sort of protected myself from. And so I think one of the things is like, as we draw from our stories and we give life to them in new characters, you know, I think that there is this, this cathartic experience through it. And so I think that while I know it benefits the reader to be able to see themselves in these characters, I think it also benefits us to be able to see ourselves mm -hmm. too. Yeah, I mean, it, it was definitely, it was, it's interesting because I, I didn't feel the catharsis when I wrote Brave Face because it was like dredging up things 20 years in the past. But one of the things that it, it did kind of allow me to do was was look at my younger self with a little bit more compassion and a little bit more forgiveness. And and I think that that's something that a lot of us you know probably need to do, so. Absolutely. And Rocky, you, you kind of have a dual perspective through your, um, career, your background. Is there anything that maybe you also drew from that as a behavioral therapist? Yeah. So um, I was a behavioral coach for over a decade. And one of the things, you know, um, a breath, there was a lot of pieces of it that I wanted to show. So I wanted to show in terms of therapeutically, 
the ability to look at yourself and your depression in a way that is um, set apart because sometimes we can feel like we're completely dominated by those thoughts and those feelings. And to be able to sit back and say, are these things that I'm being told by this true? And so um, that's why in the book, every chapter is a letter and it's a letter to life, to death, to mother, to father, to depression, to all these different pieces. And um, so I wanted to show, even if it's a more on a subconscious level, ways to separate ourselves from those feelings, to look at them more objectively. Um, and then also I wanted to show like what Sean was saying is that we need so much empathy, so much love and so much compassion for ourselves because every person sort of in the book and is, you know, once we see people from different perspectives, we have a new level of awareness and, and, um, appreciation for their struggle and acknowledgement of their struggle. And so from a, a coaching background, I really just wanted people to see like those tiny wins, they matter, but also that we have like, we, we need to like tap into everything in our arsenal, you know, and, and that sometimes can feel like it's a very small one, but it still is, it still matters. Great. Um... This may have already been answered in a way, but I'll I'll pose it just to just to see what else happens. What what would you say is the hardest part about writing about mental health? You've mentioned like uh, Rocky. You mentioned specifically having to process through a lot of what you um, went through and not wanting to. But is there anything else maybe that for you guys may have been very difficult doing this? Um. You know, actually, this may sound strange, but I didn't find it difficult to, to write about my experiences with anxiety and depression. I found it really reassuring and almost liberating in a way and empowering as well, because I was, I was taking something that I had been suffering with for, you know, many, many, many years and turning it into a piece of art that could hopefully help others. Uh, my editor at the time kept checking in with me to make sure I was okay while we were working on the book. And, and I was weirdly okay. Like I felt more at peace with myself and my mental illness than I ever had before because I was using it to make something beautiful. Um, and I, I, the only difficult thing I suppose was since I was writing for young readers, like middle school kids, elementary school kids, it was a difficult balance between, yes, we want to talk honestly about this and candidly about this so that these kids know it's okay to talk about, but also make sure that I'm holding their hand through the whole thing and it doesn't get, you know, too intense for that age group. So that, that was the most difficult balancing act, but the actual process of writing about my experiences, I found, like I said, liberating and empowering, and it gave me a new sort of strength and a new, a new kind of acceptance of myself. Um, so I, you know, it may not work for everybody, but anyone who likes writing out there, anyone who even really doesn't like writing, maybe if you're struggling with mental illness, you can write about it. You can journal about it. You can, um, write letters about it to friends you really trust and just giving voice to those feelings and putting the words down on paper can sometimes be a way of working through those emotions. I absolutely felt that writing forward, writing through my emotions was a necessary thing, even if it was a difficult thing for me to do. And it wasn't difficult in that it was hard to get the words out. It was difficult to face, but ultimately, like Claire was saying, it was very empowering to be able to witness and to witness all that struggle and that ability to overcome. And I found also getting the words out uh, was, was easy. Getting mm -hmm. it out was easy. It was sort of like you broke the dam and it like all gushed, you know, <laughs> rivers rushed, gushed forward. Um, but in terms of revision, um, also because my first drafts were um, really, I think, meant for me. 
And then in terms of revising it for um, an audience that especially that centers so heavily on suicide and grapples with other very intense issues, um, we wanted to do it sensitively and we wanted to do it in a way that ultimately gave hope. And so I think the revision process, it wasn't harder, but it was with like much more, with like our eyes so much more closely, like word to word, how are we going to say this in a way that will ultimately be helpful and of value and of service. And so I found revision to be more difficult because we're taking this very intimate raw experience and then bringing it out into something that was appropriate um, to be held by others. And so I think that I'm, I'm just really grateful for the team I had that we were able to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think writing wasn't, I mean, it's always a little difficult, but for me, like the hardest part was, was what came after, like after the book was published, because, you know, like, you know, it was like Rocky said, like, you know, I work pretty hard to like be intentional about, you know, how things were put out there. So like, we are the ants, you know, like I made very sure that like, even though, you know, like Henry is like a very nihilistic character, you know, he starts off with that, like, we are the ants, like we're very small. We don't mean anything to the end, you know, where the, the meaning of it changes and it's, and it's hopeful. But what I wasn't prepared for and the thing that, that I, I still find it really difficult is, is that when people do connect to the, to the book, you know, the, the emotions that they are sending back, because like I put something out into the world and they are, are sending it back. And I wasn't really prepared for that. And that, that was really hard, you know, just because it's hard knowing that like abstractly, like I understand other people are going through these things, but then to have someone like standing in the line you know, or sending you emails and telling you their life story. And it just, it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, and that, that's actually been, you know, the hardest part. And it's also like, we, we can't control what people take out of the message. So like, um, I had, you know, a, a parent email me the, about their child who had found a copy of where the ants that this person had written in and, and was taking the wrong message from. Mm. And, you know, and, and was asking me like, could I please, you know, send, you know, his child a, a letter explaining what I, I was hoping, you know, the message of the book would be. And it's just, it's things like that. And you can't, like, you can't control the message and that is, it's heartbreaking. Um, and, and so, yeah, like that for me is the hardest part is just knowing that having those emotions just given back to you. And, and, and it's great. Like, it's a great feeling. Like when someone is like, you know, crying and, and it meant something to them, but then also feeling their pain is really tough. Um, but I'm still very appreciative of it. Like that they are as open to expressing themselves, you know, and, and I don't know, it's just a, it's, it's such a mixed up bag of emotions. I think it's very humbling, right? When we get those, those messages, because really, you know, for some people, I know if I was that teen, it would have been one of the first times we share, you know, something so intimate or so raw and, um, and I think part of the reasons we're writers is we have a tremendous amount of empathy and sometimes like it can, it's a lot to hold, you know, when we're holding our own experience and then holding others. Um, but what a radical and incredible point of connection, you know, to be all these humans connected in all these ways that we never even know or see. And I, um, I feel very, I feel very um, humbled and very like feeling very much, especially because I'm, so I've been sort of in this virtual container since it came out, the getting those messages really felt like we're here, you know, we're all here. And, and even when it's heavy and even when it's hard, um, that idea that here we are, and these are our lifelines to each other, here are our anchors. And I think, you know, when we're talking about mental health, for all of us is we have to find our anchors in the world and we have to find our anchors in each other. And um, that can look so different. And the book, I call them talismans. Like everyone has their talisman that they hold on to. That's like their bit of magic that leads them forward. Um, and for me, like my thing was writing and, um, and for Ellie, it was writing too. And I think that 
um, we see that how they come into the character and then you see other you know, young people and adults that are also like you know writing is is my anchor and my lifeline so it's really it's really cool to see those connections even when they're heavy to hold sometimes yeah well i mean it's a it's a good reminder too because like one of the one of the like coolest things that happened when i was writing brave faces you know i as soon as it came out, a lot of other queer authors started emailing me and they were just like, oh my gosh, like I did the same thing. Like I stole a Playgirl from a bookstore or like I did this or I did that. And, and I remember just thinking like, you know, I felt so alone and I felt like there was no one else out there who was on, who understood what I was going through and was experiencing it. But there were, and we were all out there feeling like nobody else understood what we were going through. But like, if we could find a way, you know, if we had been able to find each other, like we would have had these connections. And I think the same thing is with mental health, like it, it, depression makes you feel so alone and anxiety makes you feel so alone. And just being able to make those connections and, and understand that there are other people going through that is a really powerful thing. Absolutely. So you guys have also touched on kind of making sure you're addressing these issues in a sensitive way. What would you say is kind of the line between being sensitive and censoring? Like, so what is like that correct way to approach mental health? That's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I. Uh, Oh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead, Claire. Okay, well, just really quickly, I, especially, again, writing for even younger readers than teens with some kind of happiness, I, I still try to be as honest as possible. Um, even when I, I knew that it might be difficult to read, even for that age group, I think it's important to speak honestly. If I had, if I had had this book when I was a kid, I would have been able to understand things about myself that I didn't realize until years later. So I think, I think it's important for when you are writing about mental health, especially, I mean, really all writing, I think should be as honest and, and true to the things that you're trying to convey as possible. For me, talking about mental health, whether it's in a book or on a panel or talking to somebody who comes up to me in a signing line and you know, shares their story. I don't, and I don't try to hold anything back. I mean, I'm not going to go into too much detail without making sure that the other person that I'm having this conversation with is okay with it. But I think, I think the more we talk honestly and openly about our experiences, then the more that we find other people, as Sean said, other people are having the same experience that we are. We just haven't found each other yet. So the more we put these kinds of conversations out into the, the public, the more we have these open, honest conversations, the less of a like weird figuring out, I think Rocky, you said figuring, out it, figuring it out in the dark uh, alone, um, the less it becomes an experience like that. And the more it becomes an experience of a community of people who are dealing with the same the same challenges coming together. I don't think that there, I don't think anyone benefits from censoring is kind of an interesting word, but I think, and that's what the revision process is about, right? So maybe in the first draft of, I, it's been so long, I don't quite remember, but in the first draft of some kind of happiness, I'm sure that I went a little too far because as Rocky said, like that draft was for me, that's the fastest first draft I've ever written. And and then you have to think about your audience, you're writing for teens, you're writing for kids. So how much you have to think about, okay, how to be sensitive for your particular audience. And at the same time, be absolutely true to your experience. And I, I don't know how to put into words like the system that I use to do that. It's really just a matter of working with your editor, your agent, people you trust, um, a lot of introspection and self, uh, you know, looking back at your experiences when you were having these challenges and thinking about what would I have wanted someone to say to me? Um, what would have been helpful for me to read or to hear? And having that sort of be your touchstone. Um, so that's kind of how I think about it, not in terms of, is this going too far? Uh, but in terms of, is this true to what the story I'm trying to tell, is this true to the experiences that I've had? 
I wrote um, a blog post for We Need Diverse Books about um, writing about suicide mm -hmm. uh, in children's fiction. And I really broke down my revision process and it wasn't, there was no system like Claire is mm -hmm. saying, there was no system, but it was about, you know, working in tandem with sensitivity readers with your editor and really finding the, the common ground to make sure that what needs to get across is mm -hmm. because of course, you know, I think when we go into younger readers and that's a different, you know, it's an, another conversation too, you know, a separate one. Mm -hmm. um, but when we're looking at teen readers, there is a maturity and attention to nuance there that we have to give them that credit for. And so to know that they can handle a lot because they are experiencing a lot, mm -hmm. but also not, you know, handing them something that is, is too much. And like, like we were talking about how, you know, first draft was for us. We, we like, for me, I know um, it was my, my first draft was very graphic and the language was also not very, as sensitive as ultimately it needed to be. Um, and I am a big, in terms of like censorship versus sensitivity, I, that's something that I really do talk about a lot because when I first started telling people that I was writing a book about suicide, there was like, oh, I would never do that. And, um, and but yet I knew that I needed to. And so I think that we have to be so honest with our experiences and then just be attentive to how or what people can hold in, in the reading of them. Mm -hmm. um, and that is go that line and is going to be different for each person and for each book and for each editor and for each school, right? Um, but hopefully the, the readers that need it most will, will find them. And as long as we're being honest and, and offering our best, I think that's, that's all we can do. Yeah. Um, I mean, especially with brave face, you know, because it, it was my experiences, but I still, you know, I talked to, uh, my therapist and I talked to a child psychologist about, you know, how to address a lot of these things. And, and I actually got a lot of pushback after the book came out from adult readers because the, the end of the message or the, the end of the book, the message was essentially like, it kind of gets better eventually over time and, and not all at once. And, you know, and, and, and it's a messy process that takes many, many years, you know, and, and they were like, well, well, how, how does it get better? When does it get better? When, you know, like, tell me. And it was just like, you know, they wanted the easy answer. You know, they wanted a book that was a roadmap to happiness. And, and that wasn't the truth, you know, and, and that wasn't the honest uh, answer. And, and so that was difficult, you know, and, and it was something though, that I spent a lot of time thoughtfully thinking about um, is, do I leave readers with this? Like, you know, it doesn't get better right away. Mm -hmm. Um, and it takes time and it's a process. And, and ultimately I felt like, yeah, I had to, because that was the truth. You know, it was leave, leave readers with hope, but also with, uh, realism because realistically, I don't want to tell people like, cause it was one of the things like, you know, you kept hearing, like I kept waiting for the depression to just go away. And now I'm 43 and depression still hasn't gone away. You know, we don't get better. We just get better at dealing with it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so like, for me, like the line is like, I feel like when censorship, like when censoring yourself, like when it becomes harmful, like that's like, that's the line. And I felt like, you know, offering hope that wasn't realistic and honest would have been harmful. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's like, that's the line for me. Yeah. I, I, love what you just said. If I had known years and years before now that it was going to be a messy process and that it's, you know, a lot of trial and error and a lot of feeling better and then sort of not regressing, but then not feeling so good. And, you know, it's a, it's a journey. It's not a, oh, we cured this thing and now you're good. It's a, let's figure out what tools work best for you so that when you are having a depressive swing or your anxiety is really high, you know how to manage it in a way that allows you to live your life as best you can. Um, something that 
I did with some kind of happiness. And again, it depends on the story. It depends on the audience. But for that particular story, because I wanted to be extremely honest, yes, but also extremely sensitive to the emotions and like stage of life of my audience, I wanted to include lots of moments of hope and fun and beauty and kids being goofy because you, I think a common misconception among people who don't know a lot about mental illness is you can have a happy life, a happy full life with lots of cool experiences and you can write books and you can create things and you can be good at your job. It's just, this is just another part of you and it doesn't define you. It doesn't make you weird or broken. It's just a part of who you are. And the journey is about figuring out how to accept that and, and, and not fight against it, but be aware of it and, and, and manage it. That was really important to me. Like, yeah, it gets, it gets better. It's, you know, depending on, depending on what you're going through, it gets better. Sometimes it gets a little worse. You're always trying to figure out what works. Sometimes what works changes over time and you have to adjust, but in the meantime, it is possible to enjoy your life and to connect to people around you and have fulfilling experiences. I, um, it's absolutely a hundred percent that, and actually, if you want to hold on to a book that's coming out in 2023, I am actually co-editing, um, a collection of short stories that are mental health, um, focused, but they're all protagonists that have some sort of mental health condition written by an author that has gone mm -hmm. through a similar experience. And the whole point, my co-editor is Nora Shalloway Carpenter. And the whole point as we were sort of envisioning what this would look like is to show Claire, like exactly what Claire was saying is that you can have a mental health condition and still lead a fulfilling life and still lead a happy life. And I think that when you are learning the ways to manage what you're going through, sometimes it can feel so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And that idea of leading a fulfilling life feels really far away. But to show those stories is really important. And, you know, stories that are messy. Um, and one, we're human. So no matter what you're going through, it's going to be messy. Um, but I think balancing that hope and and that pain is like joy and pain can coexist. And I think that's really important for us to acknowledge and realize. And um, Sean, like you were talking about that realism is that we have to, we have to be honest about that. And the thing is that so often we are sort of given a pretty box of this is the roadmap to happiness. <laughs> and then when we don't live up to that, or when like, that like lightning bolt moment doesn't lead to, you know, euphoria for the rest of your life. You feel like you've done something wrong and that's not true, you know? And I think that we shame ourselves and we make ourselves wrong so often for just having a human experience. And we have to give ourselves so much more compassion than that. And, um, and I hope that that's what these stories offer us is that we can be messy, um, whole humans, that lead fulfilling life, we can stumble, we can fall like flat in our face in the mud, but we can like crawl forward, we can stand up, we can run a little and, and like, that is something that it's worth, it's worth fighting for, it's worth figuring out. And um, I'm always just so in awe of, of the ferocity and strength of people, even in the quietest of moments. And I think that it's really beautiful to witness and capturing that in story is, is an honor and a privilege. And also I think it gives all of us the little, little bit of hope to, to hold on to. Yeah. And actually your anthology sounds really awesome, by the way. Yeah, it I does. Can't wait. Yeah. I can't wait for it to come out. Um, but, you know, like it was, it's interesting because like one of the biggest life changes came for me when I started to treat my depression, like a chronic illness. Um, and I hadn't realized it, but like my mom had given me the roadmap for how to, to, to manage this because she, when I was very young, she fell down a flight of steps and broke her back. And so was dealing with that for the rest of her life. And, and so she was, uh, you know, disabled and, 
And yet she didn't let it stop her. Like she, she still continued on with doing the things that she wanted to do. Some days were, were much harder. Some days she couldn't get out of bed when she could do the things, you know, she, she did them. And, and, and so I, I, had this roadmap for, for how to, to deal with it. And, and that's how it is now. It's, you know, when, when depression hits, I'm just like, okay, this is going to be one of those days. And, you know, and, and then when it passes, you know, but it, it gets you out of that mindset of this is my entire life now. It's just like, okay, this is just today, or this is just the next couple of days. Um, and, you know, being able to, to sort of share that mindset and, and will hopefully help others maybe. you. Uh, we actually have a question from the audience. Mm -hmm. When did you know you were ready to write about mental health and potentially your personal struggle? Mine was sort of forced upon me. <laughs> Not, <laughs> I mean, it was instigated. <laughs> it was externally instigated. So A Breath Too Late actually started as a flash fiction piece that, um, sorry, a uh, flash fiction piece that I posted online for World Suicide Prevention Day. And then someone wrote, oh, is this a book? And it planted that idea in me. And I remember <laughs> the first thought was, no, it's <laughs> not a book. <laughs> but it, it, it did plant that seed in me. And I still remember her name, that commenter. And, um, and then the, within a year of that, I was when I wrote the book and it was, I think sometimes you need to sit and face something for a while, journal about it. Like I'm heavy into journaling for me. It helps me process my feelings, um, journal about it. And then if, if you're supported by a therapist or supported by a community, also tapping into that, especially if it's something with a lot of trauma. Um, so like I said, for me, it was someone sort of uh, gave me a nudge and then I was able to uh, decide. Um, but I know that there's a lot of people that really do want to write their stories and they're just sort of preparing their heart for that. Yeah, um, for me, it was, uh, I like that phrase, preparing your heart for something. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, for me, it was, uh, I was trying to figure out what book to write next to fulfill a contract. And um, my partner at the time, I had just started like figuring out a lot of things about my mental illness, um, like in my late 20s, like it took a long time for me to be able to put words to what I'd been experiencing. Again, one of the reasons why I wrote some kind of happiness because how much easier would life have been if I had known these things sooner? Um, but my partner at the time, because we had been talking about my anxiety and my depression so much, he said, well, why don't you write about your depression? And I thought, well, sure, but that's not a story. So how do I, I liked the idea, especially because I was really starting to come to accept this part of myself and learn about it and and deal with it and treat it. Um, I, I started thinking about how could I tell this story? Who would I want to tell it for? And then what would the actual story be? I, you know, I'm going to be exploring topics of anxiety and depression, but what is the story around that going to be so that it's not, you know, just a, a, a treatise on anxiety and depression. It's an actual story that is yes, explaining these things, but also being entertaining. Um, and so I just drew upon, again, my own experiences, thinking about when did I first start experiencing these symptoms? And I thought back to when I was in fifth grade and experienced my first panic attack at school and had no idea what was going on. And so I started thinking about that age and what I was doing at the time. Um, my extended family was really close, playing with my cousins at my grandma's house and having adventures in the woods behind her house. And I thought, well, maybe that's what I need to do. I need to write for 11 year old Claire um, because she would have loved to have someone write a book like this. And so I, I took the idea of this girl who is at her grandparents' house for the summer and she's having adventures and solving mysteries. And like, that's really fun for kids to read about, but she's also figuring out that it's okay to ask for help and that she doesn't have to hide what she's feeling anymore. Um, and as I said, earlier, that much like Rocky, although I didn't write it in a week, but I, I wrote the book in a month and it just 
it just poured out of me. It was, it was such an amazing experience. And I tell kids uh, when I do school visits and, um, and library visits, I tell them it, you know, there are so many things about your experience that has value and that is worthwhile. And you can draw upon that for inspiration for your stories, whether your stories are realistic or fantastical, there's so much about your experience that is worth sharing with the world. So don't be afraid to, you know, don't force yourself to, but don't be afraid to use the things that have happened to you as a way to tell a story. Yeah, uh, I was a little less intentional. Can I come in and say that we yeah. have five minutes? Okay, I'll be really fast. Then. Yeah, I was a little less intentional. Um, it was, a, you know, the first time that I, I like, I guess, you know, uh, the five stages of Andrew Brawley dealt with more grief and less with mental health, but um, when it came to where the ants, you know, I got into the draft and I'm like, oh, I guess I'm doing this. Um, so <laughs> it, it wasn't, you know, I didn't start out thinking like, oh, I'm going to be writing about mental health. And then when it came to brave face, it was actually, it was close to uh, 20 years after I had ended up in the hospital. Um, and I was just kind of talking to my editor and I was like, well, if this, if I'm ever going to do it, this would be at the time. And, um, and people ask me now, they're like, well, when are you going to write, you know, about what happened, you know, later in your life? And I'm like, in another 20 years, because that's how long it'll take me to, to have the necessary distance. All right. In these final five minutes, I'll uh, ask another of our audience questions. How do you balance being open about mental health with the performative atmosphere that has erupted surrounding it? Ooh. That is a question. Uh, and we only have like three minutes. Quite a finale. Um, I actually feel a little lucky because, I mean, I've been in publishing for 11 years now and, and Where the Ants came out in 2016. And, and so I've just, I, I just keep doing what I'm doing. Like I just keep talking about it um, in, in the way that I always have. And I kind of, because I have a lot of ideas, you know, thoughts about the performative issues in social media, especially as it relates to queer identities, but we don't have time for that. So um, I just think, you know, being yourself is, is always the best sort of, of armor that you can wear. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I have been talking about mental illness online for years, and I feel like it's just it's, it, it, it is about being yourself and just being authentic when you're talking about things that affect so many people and are so important to so many people. Um, I, I don't, I think it's important to not veer into the, well, you know, I, I need to sell books. So I'm going to talk about this to sell books. It's, it's about, it's about keeping in mind the importance of forging genuine connections with people for whom that connection might be life-changing and keeping that in the forefront as your touchstone and letting that dictate how you interact with others. Um, you know, at this point in my career, I, I'm sure, you know, I'm trying to sell books, but more than that, I'm trying to be real and be true and write books that are true and write books that reach people and give people lifelines, give people escape, um, give people entertainment, um, give people things to think about. And just keeping that in my sight as my goal is what keeps me true to myself. Absolutely. I think all of those things are so important. I, at the heart of it all is, is to show up as we, as we truly are and to offer what, what offer of our experience, what we feel safe doing. And I think that, you know, every author that will do it differently for me personally, I really want people to come to my social media space and know that they are like, this is a safe place. Right. And then no matter what I'm talking about, I want that to be there. And so even though I'm at the beginning of the writer journey, right. Or the author, this author career and being in the public space, something that I'm always committed to know as a behavioral coach before and just in in life before is that I want to be I want to offer safe haven and I want to my message to anyone is that you know they are worthy of being seen exactly as they are and um, they are deserving of a beautiful whole fulfilling life 
um, no matter how they need to find it. And so the way the everybody will do it differently. And that's the thing is all of our stories, we could write about the exact same diagnosis and it would be completely different. And so to honor that and to know that and to know there is a spectrum of experience and there's so many nuances to them and to show up with what is real and true for you. Um, and I know that's what we are doing for ourselves is what's real and true for us. And, and that's, that's our, our way into the world. And I think just choosing to keep stepping on that plane or on that path is going to keep us in that space of genuine connection. Yes, round of applause. Thank you, everyone. It was so yeah. wonderful being here with you guys. Yes, thank, thank you, you. Sean, Rocky and Claire. Um, though this panel will be ending, they all of our authors here will be speaking more. So if you wanna keep following them along throughout the day, um, Rocky will be at 12 in the Real Deal Writing Realistic Fiction panel, at two, A Day in the Life panel, and at three, Overcoming Obstacles. And then you can continue to see Sean next up in the, uh, 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 Who Am I Writing Authentic LGBTQ Voices, and then at two, Writing bad characters that you love to hate. And then finally Queer Breakfast Club at 3 p.m. And then Claire finally will be up in the Unlikely Heroines panel next at noon. So since we do have to end to make sure that they can all get to their respective panels next, we do have to say goodbye, but uh, it's more of a see you soon <laughs> in the next panel. So thank you all again for speaking to us today about such an important topic. Oh, thank thank you. you. Thank you, Erin. Thank, thank you, volunteers. And yes. thank you, audience. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everybody.